Good morning on this first Sunday of Lent. I start with the watchword from 1 John 3 verse 8. The reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's works. Just a few announcements on the 3rd of March coming Friday we have the World Prayer Day. In Belleville this year it would be at Kreuzkirche at our Church of the Cross at 10 o'clock. So coming Friday 3rd of March World Prayer Day all are welcome at the Church Kreuzkirche at 10 o'clock. The Easter market is coming closer and we're quite excited for that so please keep your eyes and ears open. The filling of the eggs still needs to happen. That will be on the 11th of March at the church and baking on the 15th and 14th of March. Please contact Christiana Duve for more. The bazaar is going to be good this year. We got someone in for the children as well. And I think it's going to be a wonderful day on the 25th of March for our Easter bazaar. Church day is coming closer. Next Sunday on the 5th of March we have the church day. Where all the Western Cape churches come together. It will be at Philippi this year and start at 10 o'clock. If you need transport just let us know and we can organize how we can maybe drive there together. There will be no YouTube service on that day. Let us pray together. Lord we thank you for how good and great you are. The world is troubled. There are so many questions. We wonder what is to happen next Lord. We ask why this would happen, why that. We know, Lord, that you, in the end, will remain true. That your will will be done, Lord. And that whatever comes our way, we can walk through that with you by our sides. Help us, Lord, and today, let this text, which is challenging, guide us in our week. Amen. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our service text today is from the book of Job. Now Job forms part of wisdom literature together with some Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And these books and Psalms of wisdom deal with the difficult questions of life. When you read them, you see that at times they contradict one another as if coming from a voice from different teachers which is understandable as life is not always simple as this or that and with the story of Job we do not have simple wisdom teachings such as Proverbs or Ecclesiastes but rather a story that has different characters that play off somewhere in the East at some unknown time Uz is mentioned in Lamentations 4 and Jeremiah 25 but very little is known of it. We assume that it is in the East, as the friend of Job's come from the East as well. And the story which plays off in some unknown time comes with difficult questions and no easy answers. In our story, the first three scenes have already played out. In the first, we are told about the main character, Job. The second plays off in heaven with a kingly court and God residing as the king. In the third scene, the first of the disasters hit Job, where all his worldly possessions and his children are taken away. The characters we have in our play are Job, the rich and pious man, which would make sense with the wisdom teachings we find in Proverbs, where doing right leads to blessing. We have God as the king, and with him his counsel, who are called the sons of God, or in other translation, heavenly beings, of which we do not know much. But we know that God is there and they in some way have to give report to Him. As part of these sons of God or heavenly beings, we have an adversary character who is called the adversary or Satan. Satan being the Hebrew word for adversary. And he is subordinate to God. He can do nothing without God's approval. And so he has to go and see what is going on in the world and bring back reports to the king, to God. 
On a side note, we should not see this adversary or the Satan as the devil we find in later Jewish and Christian writings. The use of the article the before the word and also a verb coming from the same word stem and its regular use in secular texts confirms that we are not here dealing with a title but rather a description of a function. This is why this adversary is also completely subordinate to God to whom he must bring reports and is dependent on. He cannot do anything without God's approval and God could also simply dismiss his request. So the stage is set and we already heard what happened in the first three scenes and now the heavenly council gathers together again for the second time in the fourth scene and again as part of the sons of God the adversary comes and God asks him a question of where he has been. What is the report he has to give? I read first Job 2 from verse 1. And again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And the Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to the Satan, From where have you come? The Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to the Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast to his integrity, although you incite me against him to destroy him without reason. And the Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man is he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to the Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So the Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and struck Job with a loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he, Job, took a piece of broken pottery with which he scraped himself while he sat in the ashes. In our scene, the adversary's answer to God's question is similar to what we find in scene 2. He has gone to and fro on the earth, and God asks, Have you seen my pious servant Job? Which we hear with the added knowledge that Job is no longer wealthy, but that he has lost everything, everything has been taken from him. God even adds that it is due to what the adversary had said that he had allowed this disaster to happen. The adversary does not yet stop. He continues to twist and turn God's arm. He continues to say, yes, you have taken his possessions, but if you touch him, he would turn and curse you. And again, the God character, which seems quite human, allows this to happen to his servant to prove how good and pious this servant is, leading to Job's life being spared, but his body being covered in sores, him sitting on an ash heap, scraping at himself with a piece of broken pottery. The first bit of wisdom teaching I see here is that Job does not give answer to what has happened. He does not seem to accept nor reject. He does not seem to question or challenge what has happened to him in the last few days. Rather, the story continues to probe further. This might be one of the most challenging things when it comes to difficult times, because we all want answers to why things are as they are. Due to God's love for us, we, He has given us free will. And with free will comes the ability to harm others, to hurt and destroy, leading to suffering. Humans are also placed within creation, which we should take care of, but we do not, leading to further destruction and chaos. I continue from verse 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. The story continues, and we are introduced to another character, Job's wife, who plays a minor role in the story. We should remember that she has also lost everything. She has not been hit by illness or disease, but her children are also gone, together with all the possessions that they had. And she asked Job, why is he holding on to his integrity? Why does he not simply curse God and die? From her perspective, Job is the reason why these horrible things have happened to her as well. I think it makes sense then for her to ask Job to turn away 
were from his integrity and to take himself out of the equation by cursing God. Her request uses words both from God, hold fast to his integrity, and from the adversary to curse God. And this makes her an earthly version of what God and the adversary were discussing. Job's reaction gives us the second bit of wisdom teaching. Job tells her that she is thinking foolishly and asks if not both the good and the bad come from God. And this is exactly the question that he will wrestle with because this is the wisdom teachings one finds in Proverbs. Where everything comes from God, both good and bad. If you do good, good. If you do bad, bad. But in the story of Job, this idea is challenged. All the while, Job holds on to his integrity and he does not sin. The foolish Job refers to here, I think as a reference to those who think they do not need God or any form of religion to do just what you want. It doesn't matter and to see what comes next. This would mean that you have no stability, nothing to step on and nothing to guide you on your way. As this scene comes to an end, three of our characters pretty much disappear. The adversary will not speak again and Job's wife will also not speak again. We might expect that the next scene would play off in heaven with God boasting about how good his servant is, but it does not happen. Heaven is shut. God stays quiet for 34 more chapters. God is quiet. Only at the end of this book does God speak again. But the story continues. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they come each from his own place, Eliphaz the Tenamite, Bildad the Shihid, and Shofar the Naamite. And they made an appointment together to come show sympathy and comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads towards the heavens. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was great. Three new characters enter the story, and they will be in the story till just before the end. They see Job and lament openly, tearing the robes, throwing dust on their heads. Then they sit with him in silence for seven days, until Job is ready to speak. And in chapter 3 he breaks the silence. The rest of the story mostly consists of a conversation between these four characters. But for now, I think the third wisdom teaching here is that at times it's better to just shut up and sit with someone who is going through a difficult time. I've tried to find in this story three wisdom teachings to take with us, but this is not a simple task as we see in wisdom literature that it is not simply A or B, but it is both and neither. To the character of Job, the teaching must be in line with him trying to reconcile his experience of suffering with the knowledge of his innocence. But for us reading this story, the issue is rather how a righteous person is to behave when afflicted by undeserved suffering. Forher, an Old Testament scholar, says, the concerns of this narrative, as the book as its whole, is not the problem of suffering, but the behavior of people in their experience and enduring suffering. Not the problem of theodicy, but of human existence in suffering. This is because we cannot place ourselves in Job's shoes. We will never be able to say that we are completely innocent, like the character Job is. But seeing that the character Job is innocent, his suffering is undeserved. And we have to wrestle with this tension. My three points of wisdom, to not look for someone or something to blame for the difficult times. To not simply give up on faith and God when times get tough. And when you're with someone who is struggling, to just be quiet with them are possible guidelines. But there is no perfect truth or foolproof answer to suffering. The theme of this week in the church year is temptation which I find a bit strange, as I do not see temptation as the teaching of this text. But there is the temptation to look for easy answers to this story, to say, well, Job must have done something wrong, or to say, well, 
God is cruel to let this happen. We should avoid the temptation of looking or giving easy answers. We are lucky in that we had an innocent go through suffering for us. This suffering has allowed for our sins to be forgiven. This road He walks is one of love, grace and fellowship. And we thank and worship Him, Jesus, for this undeserved suffering. As we continue to wrestle with the suffering in the world, in our own lives today. Let us pray together. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we move into this time of Lent, let us walk this road of love, grace and fellowship with Christ. In this time know that the Lord blesses and keeps you. The Lord makes His face shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord looks upon you with favor and gives you peace. Amen.